What we're doing is, first of all, looking at the foundation that we stand on when we go into counseling or lecturing, and that is having a foundation of hope and, and the firm conviction there's nothing as near this won't fix. Now, what I want to do in the next two sessions is go through the complete conference that you'll be able to do at the end of, the, of this week. And so I'm going to go through this in probably two 30-minute sessions all the way through. And the reason I'm doing that is I want to get a flow for you and I want you to see how the whole thing flows. And you'll see that best if you see it as we go through every diagram. And so I'm going to flow right through every one of them. I'm not going to go into them in detail. You don't have to take any notes. I just want you to listen and to see where we're going. What's the goal and what am I trying to describe? It's difficult to take up the cross and deny yourself if you don't know what self is. And so we need to understand self because self is an obstacle to Christ. And so I want to understand what my self life is and to give definition to that. Lamentations 340. Uh, examine and probe your ways and turn to the Lord. Do you know there's a lot of people that turn you to the Lord but they never examine and probe your ways. They just say go pray about it. And it doesn't do any good. Then there's people who endlessly examine and probe your ways, but they never get around to the Lord. And so we want to follow both. We examine and probe our ways, and then we end up going to the Lord. So as we look at that, we'll look at our first diagram. And this has to do with problems in our lives. And each of these branches represent a particular problem in your life. People come in and they talk to you about a particular thing. So let's say that the problem is my wife. And I want to talk about my wife, and we spend months talking about my wife. And eventually, the counselor says this to you, you just need a different wife. So you cut this branch off, and you've gotten rid of her, but the sap that comes out of the root goes into another branch, and it gets bigger. Well, I have to make my house payments, so I hope we never get this thing resolved. You keep coming for counseling every week, every month, every year, because I'm going to keep finding something new that we need to work on. But we have a saying, if you like the fruit, dig and dung the root. If you hate the fruit, lay an axe to the root. So what is it that feeds all of this? And maybe we ought to go to the root. And I'm not saying that these things aren't important, they're not a struggle with you, that they're not significant. But I am saying that we ought to look at what feeds these things. And then we can come back to them and look at it from a different approach and from a different angle. When we look at man, and we have a model of man of spirit, soul, and body, some people don't like that model, so we can use another model later on of an inner and an outer man, but basically we're trying to get a handle or an understanding of how you function and why you function that way. God made you out of the dust of the earth, that's your body. He breathed his spirit into you and you became a living soul with mind and with will and with emotions. Why did God create you? Because he's love. He created you to be the object of his love. And to make sure that you would come to Him, He put in your spirit spiritual desires. Desires that only He can meet. The problem we have in relationships is that we look to other people to meet the needs that only God can meet. You didn't love me, you didn't accept me, you didn't give me assurance, you didn't give me security, you didn't make me feel significant. I'm trying to milk out of you what only God can meet. As one lady in Oklahoma said, and I really liked it, she said, our marriage is like two ticks and no dog. I said, that's exactly right. A tick can't live on a tick. A tick's got to live on a dog. So we're trying to milk those needs out. And the first problem I have then, being born dead to God in the Spirit, is that I'm completely self-centered. All that matters is me and me getting my needs met, period. Now there's a second problem being born dead to God in the Spirit. Your mind, will, and emotions are like an automobile. They need a driver. Sanity is your mind, will, and emotions in touch with reality. What's reality? It's God. Insanity is your mind, will, and emotions out of touch with reality. And if you're born dead to God in the spirit, then what's your condition? Insane. You're insane. So not only are you self-centered, but you're also insane. And that's very important to understand. You're crazy. Now, here's the third thing that's wrong. I was created for God, but I don't have God. He's not the source of my life. And so now, in my self-centered, insane condition, I go to other self-centered, insane people and say, would you please tell me who I am? Well, that makes a lot of sense. So I've got crazy people defining me. And then I live my life trying to change the identity that they gave me. 
So those three things are wrong the day I'm born, dead to God and the Spirit. The first thing is, I'm going to look to other people to meet my deepest needs. All religion is, is an attempt to get your deepest needs met from the outside in. And it's not true that there are no religious people. Everyone is religious. They have something they do in the world, something they do in their body, something to think or feel or do with the promise that it's going to meet your needs. The thing is, it can never meet your needs. And you'll continue to crave to have that met. And the more you fill the vacuum in your heart that was made for Christ with something other than Christ, the more you'll notice the vacuum. And actually, the more you feed the flesh, the more the desires of the flesh are going to go up in the appetite of the flesh because it can't fill this vacuum. It's absolutely impossible. The amazing thing is this, and we believe this, that when Christ fills the vacuum, all of these behaviors start to drop off naturally. And that's what we want to see him do, is to drop off naturally. I'm self-centered. I'm insane. The, being insane means that I don't judge my thoughts. So when you have a thought, is it God's thought, Satan's thought, your mind, your emotions, your body? What is it that's speaking? Most people never judge their thoughts. And we don't know where the thoughts come from. And Satan loves to whisper to me. He doesn't walk up to you and say, you're worthless, you're a failure, you're unacceptable, you're no good. He comes behind you in a voice that sounds exactly like yours and said, I'm worthless and a failure and unacceptable and no good. And you turn around and you don't see anyone and you go, yeah, I am crazy. I am worthless. I am a failure. Some of you have been standing on a bridge and you hear a voice say, jump. Some of you doers have been standing on a bridge and heard a voice that said, push. <laughs> well, you got to say no to the voice. Do you judge your thoughts? Where do the thoughts come from? And a secret is this, Satan wants you to believe that temptation reveals your deepest desires. Because as soon as you believe that, they become your obsession. We start thinking about something and whatever gets our attention gets us. So this pen isn't that big, but as I bring it forward and toward me, it becomes huge. We focus on a sin in our life, on a situation in our life, until it's all we see. And we can't see anything else. And we've already established that the only hope is when my eyes are on him and not on the problem. And he gets me to obsess on these things. And now instead of having one problem, I have two. I'm not saying it's not an issue. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But when he's not your focus, now you've got two big problems. And so the idea is to have our eyes on him and, and for him to be our focus. We've also developed, then I said, self-centeredness, insanity, and an image that controls me. So we have our little identity circles here. And in this um, circle, you write the impression you'd like to leave a room full of people. We're going to take a break. What do you want them to say about you? You're wonderful, you're kind, you're spiritual, whatever you want to say. But here's the fact. What you are at your worst moment is the true condition of your flesh. So at your worst moment, how do you describe yourself? Well, I'd like you to think that I'm spiritual and I'm a success and I'm intelligent. But over here at my worst, I know that I'm worthless and I'm a failure and I'm unacceptable and unlovable. No one would want what you are at your worst. So we go to the sewing machine, stitch up a little success suit, zip it all the way up here. And as I said before, Adam and Eve in the garden want to clothe themselves. So you clothe yourself with something. And you go out into the world and treat people this way. Come here because I'm wonderful, but stay away. I don't want you to see who I really am. And we're constantly in conflict and constantly covering up. People control me on the positive by agreeing with the image I want to present or on the negative by disagreeing with what I want to present and telling me that I am worthless. Now, how did we get that kind of identity? In our self-centered, insane condition, we looked to other self-centered, insane people and said, who am I? And they told you who you were through overt or covert behavior. So there's two ways I can tell you I don't like you. One is say I don't like you, the other is just pack up my things and leave. You look to them to meet spiritual needs. If they met them, you developed a positive image. If they didn't meet them, you developed a negative image. And so we can look at some of the things in your life that took place to give you this negative image. When you have a negative image, again, or a positive image, people will constantly be controlling you. They can pull at you. It's one of the things we talk about, that here's a rock, and you can't move that rock with a bar. It's impossible. 
What's missing? You've got to have a leverage point. And if you have a leverage point, you can move it. Where I hold my image, where I have my identity, where I'm trying to change it, where I'm trying to maintain it, is where people can move me. If I'm trying to pre present myself as intelligent, all someone has to do is tell me I'm stupid. And they'll move me. So we're controlled at our point of image by other people. When I look at identity messages that we get in our self-centered, insane condition, here's one of the biggest ones that we get, and we'll just say in passing that it does affect our concept of God. Down here is all the people you know. If I take you and divide you in two, on this side who I am and on this side what I do, why do people accept you? Because of who you are or what you do. What you do, always. And it doesn't matter how much you do. You do A, B, and C just fine, and you do D wrong, and you're rejected. People don't say, well, I'm just remembering all the good you did right now, so don't worry about it. That's not what we do. So all of our relationships are based on performance and what we do, and now I'm going to want to talk to you later on about God, and if every relationship with people was based on what you do, how will you assume your relationship with God's based? Yeah, on what I do. Now, people could give me a big list of things to do to make them happy. How big a list can God give me? If those are the glasses that I have. And so I have my little glasses and it affects everything I see. And I put these on and open up the Bible. And I'm looking for performance to get acceptance. How much performance will you find in the Bible? It's endless. And you just go on and on and on and on and on performing. And the day you do one minus, you don't even wait to hear God say, I love you. You're my child based on birth, not on what you do. Instead, what we do right away is we run. And most people that are self-centered and insane with a controlling image and identity are constantly on the run from God. And we've been taught that God accepts me on the basis of performance. And so here's the mountain of acceptance, and here's how people have treated us. If you keep rule number one and keep your room clean, I'll love and accept you. So you keep that rule as a kid, and you get up here, and what do you get? Rule number two, I don't want you to hang around those kids. And when you get up there, what do you get? Well, rule number three. And when you think you're going to get acceptance, you get this. And when a child sees that there's nothing they can ever do to get acceptance, what they'll finally do is say, rain on that. I'm going to jump off of this. I'd rather live down here in rejection than play your game anymore because you'll never accept me. And I'm done with it. And now I'm in rebellion. And to show you how mad I am, I'm going to break all the rules that you gave me that promised to give me acceptance. We look at how this controls us <clears throat> when it comes to a problem. We've said you have a problem. You came with a problem, whatever the problem is. We put the problem in this circle. Is the problem the problem? No. no. So we can put the problem down and we can say that it's, it's, it's alcohol, it's depression, it's whatever it is. I've got a problem here. My problem's depression. Well, we'll give you a lot of drugs so you won't be depressed anymore. Will that fix it? No. no. And what we'll look for then is an event that caused the depression. Why are you depressed? Well, my mate said they didn't love me anymore. Well, Betty told me once she didn't love me anymore, and I told her, that's the most foolish thing you've ever said. I'm the most lovable guy you'll ever meet. That's ridiculous. How could you say that? I said, you just have a headache or something, because you'd have to be out of your mind. There's nobody that love you the way I do. And I went on like that. It didn't bother me. Why did this other fellow get depressed and I didn't? Well, first of all, when you have an event... To have a problem, you have to go into rebellion, and the only thing that justifies rebellion is anger. Whenever someone's getting angry, they're getting ready to rebel. Whenever you're doing the thing you know you shouldn't do, you're always angry. Because anger makes you feel good about what you're doing. But why did the woman saying she didn't love me affect me so much? It's because I brought into the relationship feelings of worthlessness, unacceptableness, that were developed in my self-centered, insane condition with other self-centered, insane people. And now what happens is an event today strips off my success suit 
that I was covering myself with. And I'm standing there naked, feeling worthless and unacceptable and unlovable. I'm angry, I rebel, and I find a way to cope. What if we could give you a new life? Instead of being worthless and a failure and no good, we could give you a new life. If Christ could come and the old life could be crucified and replaced with his life, just like there's a branch in a vase and it's learning how to live while it dies and we graft it into the vine, the life of the vine becomes its life. And if Christ could become my life, Colossians 3, 4, then if he were acceptable, I'd be acceptable. If he were pleasing, I'd be pleasing. If he were close to God, I'd be close to God. If I had a new identity and the old one was gone, would this event still bother me? No. If I say to you, if I say to you men today, you know, Keith, there's something. I, here, I really think you're a woman. <laughs> and you need to put on a dress. Would you put on a dress? Well, Keith wouldn't get mad at me. He's not going to get angry or upset or anything. He's just going to say, that guy's crazy. It's not going to affect him. Things only affect me because I really believe it about me. It's impossible that someone made you feel worthless. I've always felt worthless, and your behavior just proved that I was hiding it. And so I had it zipped up, and now your behavior proves it. And I'd rather talk about how rude you were to make me feel worthless than the fact that I brought it into the relationship. But if I could get a life, a new life, and the old life could go, then the event wouldn't bother me. If the event didn't bother me, I wouldn't get angry, I wouldn't have to rebel, and I wouldn't have to have the problem. So what we're talking about is not dealing with the fruit. We started out looking at the little tree, not looking at the branches, but looking at the root, what the root issue is. And the beginning point is, is that I need a life. I need a source to my source, and my source is my heart, and I need in that source God. I need Christ as the source of my life. And that begins to change everything in a ripple effect. When you look at people, we have a little anxiety ruler. And people can only stand 100% anxiety, and then they have an explosion. Well, here's boy A, and this is boy B. And the worst thing that ever happened to boy B is he was spanked when he was born in the hospital. So he thinks it's a mean world. The worst thing that ever happened to boy A is he's never discovered who his father is. In terms of feeling worthless, unacceptable, and unlovable, he's at 50 and this guy's at 5. Both of them are dating girls and the girls break up with them. Well, he thinks that's bad, but then there is that new girl at school, so I may ask her out. He goes to 10% in feeling worthless and unlovable. This fellow has his girlfriend break up with him. And a 5% event for this fellow is how much for this one? 20. 20, do you see why? Because it's confirming the image that he already has is in a self-centered, insane condition. And now her problems become his problem. He's at 70. Now both boys get married, and marriage adds 35% anxiety to anybody. No matter how valuable you thought you were, you're going to dip. You're going to take a bit of a dip there. And so this guy, or adds 25%, this guy goes to 35%. Guess who just ran out of room? And that's why the person we married often isn't the person that we married. We don't even recognize them. Now, he's living at 95, and 95 becomes normal. He's living at 35. Life is full of 6% events. The flat tire, the milk getting knocked off on the rug, the dog going on the rug, all of that kind of stuff, 6%. This fellow, when it happens, goes up to 41 and drops back down. What happens to this guy? He explodes. He loses it, completely loses it. He's gone. And people are looking at him going, what was that all about? And then he's deceived into believing that the 6% events in life, if they could all get sorted out, he would be happy and peaceful. I laugh about this one fellow who comes to our uh, retreats and we'll all get up and share and talk a little bit. And he'll come there and he lives at a 99 every day. And so when he comes to the retreat, he drops all the way to a 98. And he'll stand there in front of everybody and go, Oh, it's, it's just so nice to be here and unwind. I haven't felt this loose in years. Somebody hold me down, I could just float away. And he's like that the whole time. And you're getting tense just watching him. 
But he's at a 98, dropped all the way to a 98. That's a wonderful way to live. And life is full of 6% events. But if we could get rid of this and have his life and the peace of God in me, then these events, I'm not saying that they don't bother you, but they don't have to destroy you. A hiccup doesn't have to become throw up. So we're born dead to God, self-centered, insane. We got an image that people have given us. We're trying to change it. We're being controlled by other people. And then we're born without God, but we need a God, so we've all developed our own gods. We have the story of Rachel and Leah, and you know the story. When they got ready to leave, the one thing they took, even though they'd gotten everything, was the idols. Their household idols. Why did they want those? Because just in case God doesn't help me in the future, I can turn back to my old idol. We all enter the Christian life with a bag full of idols. The way I know that all of you have idols in this room is that you're here today because if you don't have any, you kill yourself. You found a way to cope without Christ. And so you have your idols. When you look at the Old Testament temple and God works in patterns, uh, you have the three parts of the temple, the Holy of Holies where God dwelt. You have the holy place where the, where the service of the priest took place. And then you have the outer court. And in man, you have a spirit, and you have a soul, and you have a body. Christ has come, and we are the very temple of God. That's an amazing thing in the Bible when Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. The reason they were angry with him is that the word he used for temple was not the structure, but the holy of holies in the Greek, the nous. So he's saying destroy the very holy place where a priest only goes once a year and I'm going to rebuild that in three days. And that's why they got angry. But what he was saying is, I am that temple. I'm that temple. I'm where God dwells. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul then says that you are the temple of God and the word that he uses there is the nous, that you're the holy of holies, that God himself is now dwelling in you. Well, here's a problem. That is good news. Here's the problem with that. He's dwelling in me, but I have a veil here that never allows him to be released. A veil of flesh. And the veil was only the width of a man's hand, but it might as well have been as wide as this room because you weren't going there. You couldn't get on the other side of it. It didn't matter how big it was. And so we have... Christ dwelling in us, we have a veil of flesh, and that leaves us living the Christian life in the power of the soul and in the power of the body, and hence you have the half-converted person. You will go to heaven because you have the life of Christ in you, but you're half-converted. Because this veil, if it were to go, and it was rent from top to bottom, the life that was in would flood through here, and life would be lived out of the power of the Spirit. Well, as we look at that, what is that veil of flesh? What makes it up? And the veil represents the old man, the Adam life, the sin nature, whatever you want to call it. So we have this veil here, and, wh and what's God's method for dealing with that veil? As you look at it and how the veil is made up, and these, this, this would be your idols, what makes up the veil on, on one dimension is on the one hand you had hurts in your life and you were born without God. So you had to find a way to cope with the hurt. So you have a hurt and you found a way to cope with it. The world calls it coping. The Bible calls it idols. An idol is anything I trust in, cling to, and rely on in stress and pressure other than Christ. Those that cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could have been theirs. So you had a hurt, you didn't have a God, you were born dead to God, self-centered, insane, controlling image, and you looked to yourself for the source to figure out how to cope with that. There's a variety of idols. And so you can say, here's, here's a person, they were abandoned by their father. Okay, well, how did you cope with that? There's a lot of ways to cope. People withdraw, they go into self-hatred, they get drunk, they do drugs, Sex is a popular idol because sex does two things. It relieves me from my pain temporarily 
and it relieves me from my rejection. And that's why it's such a popular idol. There's idols that are ugly idols. There are grade B idols. I just listen to music. I get depressed. I go shopping. I go, I uh, get alone. I watch movies. There's grade A idols. I'll go do ministry and let people tell me I'm wonderful while I'm doing ministry. I'm not saying everything's an idol, but it can be an idol for you. But there's one sure way to tell if people are idolaters, and that's the symptoms of an idolater. And you'll see these symptoms whenever you see a person trusting something other than Christ to be their source. You'll see worry and doubt and fear and anxiety and depression because we're trusting something that doesn't help. Self-centered, insane, controlled, and then finding my own source outside of God in the form of an idol. Idols are interesting to me, and they're kind of like a cave. Because what people will do when the pressure's on, they tie onto the rope and they go back into the cave of their idols and they hide there. And here's the thing, you will never grow up and never attain maturity hiding in the cave with your idol. It's an interesting thing, and, and all of you know this, but if you have somebody who's an alcoholic and um, they started drinking when they're 14 and now at age 54 they sober up, do you know emotionally they're still 14? Because the only way you mature in life is to hit life straight on, head on, with him as your source. And if you run to any other idol then, you'll become emotionally thwarted and you will not mature. And it doesn't matter what the idol is. You've seen people, you know, that, that have, they're just suffering from the selfish single syndrome. But you can see them where they just, their whole life is just around them. They, they come to your house and they got to get the, the salt and pepper shaker around them and the water around them and the ketchup over. They got their whole little territory, their whole little thing all laid out there. Their whole world is all organized just for them. And they've got the whole thing centered around them. And they have their ways of coping and their ways of getting, well, you don't mature that way. And insanity is the same way. I'm, I've seen insane people. I know insane people. People think I'm insane. So I know it really exists. But I also know that there's 90% of people that it's a way of coping. Because the advantages of it are greater than the disadvantages. We tie onto the rope and we head back in here. Now, he wants me to give up my idols by choice. How will he do that? How will he bring me to the place where by choice... I lay them down because choice is everything. Christ laid down his life because he chose to. And it's only good if you choose to. God will not pry anything out of your hand. But instead, he wants you to lay it down because you can't hold on to it and grab him at the same time. What is the process of me losing that? And you might be in that process.